So uh, if you would, um, just go ahead and uh, open your Bibles uh, to Acts chapter 16. That's where we're going to be this morning uh, for the majority of the lesson. And I told, I had a sign back there uh, by my class and it said, you know, come in the auditorium. I was teaching the auditorium class and I want everybody to sit together if you're in the high school class so that um, you can answer all the questions. Because we've already covered all this, so they should they should know it. We, uh, for those of you that may not know, uh, I'm very proud of our um, seventh through twelfth uh, graders that are in class. And and I might mention last week, I believe it was, we had about twelve uh, in class, and so it's great to see um, some of our visitors coming and. Great to see uh, that that age level kind of growing a little bit. But we're talking about uh, the plan of salvation um, in there. And uh, we're using a particular study that I use um, that's just uh, kind of just a simple version of walking through the plan of salvation. And they're uh, actually marking their Bibles with page numbers and um, learning uh, where everything kind of is and how it fits together. Uh, But the main thing is trying to memorize it. And I tell them, you know, we kind of do the same thing, start the same way every class period. I said, well, you know, how do you learn songs? How do you, you guys, you know, young people, they can just rattle off songs and, you know, the lyrics to songs. Well, you know it because you hear it all the time, right? It's repetition. I said, we're doing the same thing in, in, in Bible class with this plan of salvation is, is you're going to memorize it. You're going to know where page numbers are. You're going to know where to find things and, and then when you get there, you're going to, right now, we're just kind of, what's the gist? What's the gist of uh, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2? What's the gist of, of Romans uh, 3? What's the gist of Romans 6? And just so that they kind of get an idea of, of those things. And one of the examples that we cover after we go through the plan of conversion is the Philippian jailer. I love this account and this example of the Philippian jailer. And I'm like, what do we normally think about when we think about the Philippian jailer and his conversion? What do we think about? What kinds of things come to your mind when you think about the Philippian jailer? Acts chapter 16. Anybody? Anybody? High school? 7 through 12? Absolutely. He and his whole family. Is that not encouraging? He and his whole family. You got to get excited about that. When one learns the gospel and is converted, and then his family or her family follows, man, that's that's the best way of um, evangelism. That's the best way of growing um, the church is through families probably uh, difficult at times, you know, we understand that. Uh, it can be difficult trying to convert families, uh, especially if they're, they're strong religiously in, uh, in another denomination. What else? Yeah. goes from the very, I mean, you can't get any lower in regard to where you are in life and, and the circumstances that you're in that you're about to kill yourself. And then go from that state to saved, to rejoicing, to becoming um, a Christian or in the family of God. There's so much more. There's so much more in this account, this example, than just an example of conversion. There's so much more. And, you know, we have, 
you know, I, I just made some notes, and these, I, if you were in the adult class, Joe Carpenter's adult class, uh, a couple, I don't know, probably the second or first Sunday in January, I did the same lesson. I was sub for him, and uh, I did the same lesson, so I apologize if you were in that class, but um, I've added to the lesson since then. There's, because there's so much more. You think about this, this lesson and this account, um, you have suffering. Uh, suffering on the part uh, of Paul and, and, and Silas. You have endurance. You have perseverance. You have a lesson in dedication. You also have um, an example of singing and the effects that just our singing can have on one another and other people. Uh, you have uh, how our example, how significant our example can be to others who might be listening and or watching what we're doing. You also have a, a great example of evangelism. You mentioned the family. Um, you have an example of suicide, attempted suicide. Um, you have uh, obviously about belief in, in, in Jesus and you have the actions that follow, um, how our environment and our surroundings can affect who we are. Uh, and then you have probably the most vital question asked in Scripture, which is what? What is the probably most vital, important question that can affect a person's life in anything else? What must I do to be saved? Yeah. Understood, acceptable, nobody would blame them at all. Yeah, that's what I said, our example, what we do. How we react to certain situations in our lives where uh, society might think this is the norm. This is how we react versus a Christian's response to the same situation and how strong our example is. Uh, you have... Like Laura said, the saving of a family. Not just, not just the jailer, but you have the saving of this family. We don't know how many were saved at this time. But he, not only he, but his household. And then you have repentance. You have um, urgency. You have some urgency there. Uh, there's no waiting. There's no waiting when it comes to responding uh, to the gospel and what you must do. Uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to wait. Uh, how to live. Um, our joyfulness. Even example of, of how we might need to behave and act as a Christian. You have an example there uh, in, in this particular um, story. Uh, you know, God often uses um, adverse circumstances, and obviously this is one of those examples, to lead people to him. Uh, and we have example over example uh, in, in Scripture about using adverse situations, difficult times, struggles uh, to lead people. Uh, and we need to realize that, that one of the purposes for you know, which God often uses our circumstances to show us how much we need him. To show us the part that he can play in our lives. And, and when we are about to take our lives. For, when we're about to, to be dead spiritually that uh, we can be shown uh, life through him. And the gospel message. And, you know, we've talked about that. What does the gospel mean? What does the gospel mean? Well, what's the good news? What's the good news mean? Well, the good news is, well, of course, Jesus. Um, 
his birth and, and his life and his ministry and, and his death and his resurrection and, and what all that means. But high school class, what does the gospel mean? Hmm? Yeah, to be saved, way to be saved. We were dead. We were dead. And the gospel means life. From death to life. That's the gospel message. That's the gospel message. The wages of sin is death. We were dead. But the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus. The gift from death to to life. So I want to start in verse 16 and just see the circumstances that happened leading up to, and they're on their second uh, missionary journey, and they're finding themselves in you know, Philippi, and, and this happens. It, you know, they went to prayer, verse 16, they went to prayer. I don't know what that means, what the significance of it, but they're going somewhere to pray. And a certain slave girl possessed by a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. And this girl, they, they followed Paul. She followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. So who's, who's here? Just you know, And I know we're not necessarily talking about the Philippian jailer yet, but we're leading up to it. So uh, Luke writes, um, you know, now it happened as we went to prayer, and uh, Paul, uh, this girl followed Paul and us, and cried out, who's, she, who's, he, who's us? Who's we? Who's all involved in this right now? Well, we know it's Paul, right? know it's Silas. Who else is there? Who else is with Paul and Silas? <clears throat> Timothy? Luke? Okay. Picked up Timothy, remember? Um, earlier in 16, they pick up Timothy, and he goes with them on the journey, and then we have Luke, who's writing Acts, um, and uh, for the most part, eyewitness accounts uh, of what's happening here with, with Paul and Silas, and so we know who all is involved, and this, this girl in 17, um, she knew who they were and what they were doing. She knew. What were they doing? They were going about saying these, you know, they were going about preaching, telling people about the way of salvation, what people needed to do. Because she, she's going around chasing them for many days behind them. And she's screaming and shouting, I can imagine, that these men are servants of the Most High God who um, proclaim to us the way of salvation. And it even says... That in, in the latter part of verse 18, Paul is greatly annoyed by this. So it's got to be some kind of annoying action from this, this girl. And if she is uh, possessed, you know what she's, how she's probably acting, uh, what she's doing. She's screaming. Um, and she keeps screaming all of this. And, and she does it for days. And she's following them around. And Paul, greatly annoyed, he turns and he says to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. In verse 19, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. I always thought it was interesting. Why just Paul and Silas? What, what happened to, did, did Luke and Timothy just turn pale and run? Take that opportunity to get out of, I'm getting out of here. 
The magistrates are mad. They're upset. We're leaving. They grab Paul and Silas, and they take them away. thought that was interesting. You know, who knows? Who knows? I know Paul was probably a target. They, they'd heard about Paul. They knew about Paul. And Silas, I don't know, maybe he was just close to Paul and they just grabbed him and, and took him away. I don't know the reason behind it, but Good catch, good catch. I mean, was she not speaking the truth? Uh, there wasn't anything wrong with what she said. Maybe how she was going about doing it. But, yeah, I mean, you know, Paul, Paul, maybe he probably didn't want to be associated with that. I don't, I don't want anything. They, people might think that we're like a team or something. If she's following them around, shouting that, you know, she's our sidekick kind of thing. No. No, we're not going to be associated with someone who has an evil spirit that's controlling them. And so he, he took care of that uh, really, really quick. So they, they dragged them to the marketplace authorities. You want to you wanna get someone upset really quick, you hit them in the pocketbook. Now they're profits. Whatever they're making off this girl... Uh, they just watched it disappear, probably before their very eyes. And so now she's, she's normal. Now what are we going to do? How are we going to make our money? And, uh, and they got upset um, about, about that issue. So verse 20, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews... Exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach the customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. So then the multitudes rose up. We're used to seeing this whenever the gospel is, is taught and, and people are doing what society would, would rather they not. Uh, the multitudes rise up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes. And commanded them to be beaten by rods. What, what's also interesting about this, uh, this situation right here. What can, we, what can we pull and learn from this? What do we know? <coughs> These men. Being Jews. What are we going to find out later about these men? What are we going to find out later after the fact? They're What? They're Roman citizens, right? Yeah, and they're, they're getting ready to commence beating Paul and Silas, which was highly frowned upon if you were a Roman citizen. So they're getting ready to do something that they're going to regret uh, later on. Um, and then teaching customs, which are not, what did they forget to mention? These magistrates, what did they forget to mention? They left it out. Why are they mad to begin with? Is it because of their teachings and how they're teaching against their customs and, and the things that they observe? Why are they mad? Yeah. They lost their means of profit and income. They left that out, didn't they? They didn't say anything about that. So then they lay, in verse 23, many stripes, many stripes on them, and they threw them into prison and commanded the jailer, here we come, here, here we come with the jailer, to keep them uh, secure. Having received such a charge, okay, the jailer is very serious about his job, he puts them into the inner prison. 
and fastened their feet in stocks. So what kind of picture do you get from being thrown into the inner prison, fastened your feet in stocks, dark, stinky, dungeony, any picture that you can create in your mind about a dark dungeon, this is it. I'm sure there were some rats and you know fun things like that lurking around uh, in the inner. They didn't want these guys to escape. The, the jailer was serious. He was charged with keeping them secure. I'm going to put them in the very back, the inner. We're going to go as far back as we can go. And I'm not only going to shut the, the jail gate, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fasten them. We're going to put some... We're going to put some chains on them. And one of the things about, you know, the, these stocks, and uh, they, they weren't designed for comfort. They weren't designed for security purposes um, necessarily. It was torture. It was torture. They, they would take your, your feet, and they'd, they'd spread them as far as they could go, and they would fasten them, and they'd take your hands and, and, and put them as far apart. So you're just like... I mean, there's no way you're moving. You're not, you're not going anywhere. So they're, they're definitely secure um, way back in the inner prison, feet fastened. And now in verse 25, it's midnight. It's midnight. And Paul and Silas were praying. And I, I have not, and if, you, if you've ever found anything about, like, from the time that they uh, were taken to the magistrates uh, and beaten uh, and put in jail uh, in prison, uh, the timeline of that, like, when, what day of the week was that? I don't know. It doesn't say. But if you, anybody knows anything that I don't and is able to find anything, because I search and search trying to figure out, you know, what, what day of the week? Is this? I don't know. Is it the first day of the week? Is it midnight? Is that Saturday night into Sunday morning? I, I don't know. You know, but what what time frame are we talking about? But anyway, at midnight, Paul and Silas they're praying and they're singing hymns to God. They're praying and they're singing hymns. To God, and I'm looking at the situation they're in. What would I have been doing at midnight? What do you think you would be doing, given the fact that you were just beaten severely on a bare back, taken to the innermost part of the prison, dark, dungy, dirty, wet, rats? Bugs, shackled and chained, so it's not comfortable. What would you be doing at midnight? I can tell you what I'd be doing. And it probably wouldn't be singing. I'd be crying. I'd be crying. I would be in despair. I would be upset. I would think that this is it. There's no hope. I'd be moaning and complaining. I'd be talking about my demise. But what are they doing? They're praying and they're singing hymns to God. And who was listening? That's important. That's an important part that, that we just may just skip over. You know, who was listening to this? Hmm? Other prisoners? Anybody within earshot? The jailer? Singing. 
and they're singing hymns to God. And they were listening. I, I just, I wondered what, I wonder what kind of songs they were singing. Oh, woe is me songs? Slow and draggy. And oh, what were they singing? Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. What were they singing? I, I'd, I'd love to know. Amazing grace. Yeah, I mean, they were singing songs. And, and one of the things that's interesting is, is what can we do with our singing? What do we do? What are our, what's our singing for? Why do we sing? Expression, praise, their bodies, their physical bodies were in pain, they were hurting, they were struggling, but yet with their singing, they're singing. and with understanding and with hope and with praise to their God. Even though in spite of their circumstances and situation which probably looked like it may not be any worse and if it were it would probably be death. That's what we're facing. These people are going to kill us. And then what were they doing? What, what else do we do with our song? With our singing? What do we do with one another? We edify. We uplift. We teach. We admonish. Were they not teaching? Were they not teaching in their song? And in their prayers? And who knows what else? I'm sure that wasn't it. They were talking about, if they were proclaiming salvation and the good news while they were outside, it's most certain they were doing it while they were inside. They wanted the free to hear the message, and they also wanted the prisoner. Those that were confined, those that were in chains with them, they wanted them to hear how important is our singing when we do it. The prisoners were listening to him, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, what a coincidence. What a coincidence that all of a sudden there's a big, huge earthquake. So much so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. Wow. What's special about this earthquake? Coincidence? Yeah, that, that region had earthquakes quite frequently. But what's significant about this earthquake? Absolutely. And we, we don't know a 
lot of the details uh, about cause or explanation. But I think it's just not a coincidence. I think this is miraculous. And I think that, that God freed Paul and Silas. And he shook the foundation so that the, the doors opened. The prison bars were loose and their chains were loosed so that they had the opportunity to to leave. And more than likely, you know, in the other accounts, in chapter 5 and verse 19, and chapter 12, verse 7, and 10 and 11, angels were involved in the two previous releases from, from prison. Angels were involved. And then the jailer, the keeper of the prison that was charged to keep them inside, wakes from his sleep, seeing that the prison doors were open, assuming, supposing, like anyone else, that the prisoners had fled, obviously, given the circumstances. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. What can we get from this, this verse here? Anybody get anything from it? Yeah. He knew, he knew what was going to happen to him. When they were charged with the security of the prisoner, and the prisoners left and escaped, you were held accountable. You were held accountable. Assume that something happened. Supposing? I mean, what would you suppose? If you woke up from your sleep and you were charged with keeping these prisoners secure, and you wake up after this huge earthquake and the doors are open and everything's off its foundation and hinges and you know it's like a clean clean escape route Yeah, Paul, Paul calls out, and, and he's getting ready, to remember, he's getting ready to kill himself, which, again, uh, you know, the act of, you know, he, he probably thought, who knows, you know, this might be an honorable way out for me, because I don't know what's going to happen, and, but it's not going to be good. So let me draw my sword and take my own life, and that suicide was a, was a pagan philosophy. I'll just take my life. It's not biblical. Not Christian. Suicide has never been an honorable way out for God's people. Children of God know that, that no matter you know, how bad, how bleak, how grim a situation is in life, that God will always provide a way out. Always. So that we'll be able to endure the pain of the conflict that we're in. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He will always provide a way out. But we've got to see it through. We've got to have the faith to see it through. And we can't assume that, well, this is it. All the doors are closed. No way out. I don't, I... I don't see, it's very selfish, I don't see a solution to this problem. I don't see a way out. So I'll take my life. Paul 
Paul, yeah, Paul called out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself because we're, what? Just me and Silas are here. Don't worry about it. Your prize prisoners are still here. We're all here. Which, again, when I'm reading this, I'm like, well, why did they not go? Why did the other prisoners not leave? Take off, run, go. Yeah. They could have felt the, the, the guilt. You know, and also it's like, it's interesting, you know, how, how did Paul see the jailer and the jailer not see him? And how did Paul know that, that no one had escaped? Well, maybe you know Paul's eyes were better adjusted, and, you know, be, from being in the dark. And maybe he had knowledge of the situation, and, uh, but then the other prisoners they they didn't leave. Yeah, you know, momentarily stunned, and in shock from this earthquake. You know, maybe. You know, maybe Paul asked them to stay. Maybe Paul said, hey, you, know, you guys stay with us. We'll, we'll take care of you. Maybe God kept them there. Or, and if it's me, I'm thinking I'm putting myself in the prisoner's spot, and I'm, I'm hearing the prayers, and I'm hearing the singing, and I'm hearing what they had to say, and I just witnessed this unbelievable earthquake. And what all happened? I'm sticking with these guys. I'm not going out on my own. I'm not leaving. I'm not taking any more risks. I, I'm, I'm safe right here. But we know they didn't leave. And he called for a light in verse 29. They ran in, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he, he brought them out and said, and, and, and he says, here's the question. Here's the question. And when you're talking plan of salvation, when you're talking plan of salvation with someone, you want to get them to this question. And they're not going to get to that question until they know they're dead. <clears throat> the jailer knew that he was just as good as dead. About to kill himself, about to be done with it, he's dead. And they have to understand that, that we're dead without Christ. Yeah. That's it. That's it. We know our fate. Do we not know our fate without Christ? We know what's going to happen. If we don't have Christ and we don't have light, we know our fate. And we need to get to the point with people that they understand they're dead. Until that, it's going to be difficult. And then get them to the point when they understand they're dead. What do I need to do for life? What do I need to do to be saved? I've heard the prayers. I've heard the singing. I've heard you talking about this thing called salvation and Jesus and what he did. What do I need to do? And in verse 31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Hope. Hope. We have to understand that there's, there's hope. And the jailer needed to understand that he was, if he was going to 
have life, if he was going to have hope, if he was going to be saved, it was going to be through Jesus Christ. I think Acts 16, verse 31, is one of the, the greatest verses in Scripture. It's God's briefest, quickest answer to man's deepest question. It provides a, a blessing of salvation. It provides a, a, a condition that, that we need to, we can't, I, tell, I can tell the high school class, if you don't believe something, if you don't believe it, what good is it? Got to believe it. Well, we use that whole example. You know, you been to the Grand Canyon? No. How do you know it's there? You been to the Empire State Building and the Golden Gate Bridge and Big Ben? Well, how, how do you know it's there? How do you know those things exist? If you don't have belief and trust and faith, then what do you have? You've got to start with that, that essential understand. They heard, you know, the jailer heard. But what good is it to hear if you don't believe? So they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. And then he took them that same hour. Man, man, what a message. What a message that he must have heard. And that hour he took them and he washed their stripes. And immediately all in his family were baptized. And when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he, what? Rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. Going from the brink of death to rejoicing in salvation. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's from death to life.